Hi, I'm Tom Woltage with Sun Microsystems. I'm here to show you the SL8500, our latest enterprise tape library. It has many innovative features, but some of the primary design objectives were to make consolidation simpler, to provide the highest availability possible, and to minimize your environmental cost. Let's take a look at the back first to show you how we do that. Let's start by talking about the tape drives. The first thing you'll notice different in the SL8500 is the drive bay is built in. There's a few good reasons to do that. Primarily, it's so that you can add drives without taking an outage. So you no longer have to trade off slots when you add drives. So you can scale up to 64 drives in 18500. I'll show you the pass-through a little later, but for now know that you can attach the pass-through hot so we can scale past 64 drives again with no outage. That gives you maximum availability and uptime and minimizes schedule outages. In the past, the drive bays were always something that bolted on the side of the library, so adding another one of the drive bays required shutting down a library. The next thing I like to point out about the drives is we're true mixed media. Any drive can go anywhere. So we have our high performance, high capacity T10,000 drive for the enterprise. We also have our Fast Access 9840 drive and our 9940B high capacity drive. All of those are available in native fiber channel as well as native FICON interfaces. We have mid-range drives, HP and IBM LTO drives with native fiber and finally quantum SDLT drives with native fiber. Any drive can go anywhere so any combination will work. The reason we did that is for consolidation and also for flexibility. You have the most flexibility going forward since it doesn't matter what goes where. I'll show you on the front how we do that with the cartridges, how anything can go anywhere, but in the back any drive can go anywhere as well. Another design objective of the SL8500 was high availability. So we've already spoken about how we can add drives while it runs. The other aspect is to try to eliminate unscheduled outages as best we can. So if you're trying to design a product that has the highest possible availability. You want to try to find what can break and either design it out or make it hot replaceable. So the primary culprits of what can break in a library system are the drives, the power supplies, cables and connectors, and robotics. We'll cover the robotics when we're in the front of the box, but now let's start with the drives. Each drive is actually completely hot replaceable. So should the drive fail, we can replace it with another drive. When we plug it in, the library has dynamic worldwide name. What that means is that this port has a name that's given to it by the library, so when the replacement drive is plugged in, the library will shoot the worldwide name to the replacement drive so you don't have to reconfigure your software. As long as your application software uses worldwide name, we can replace a drive without reconfiguring. The next thing to talk about in terms of reliability is power supplies. The SL8500 is designed to actually run off of two separate AC grids. Should one of them fail, the entire library will continue to operate normally, all the drives, the robot, and the electronics. In this case, we didn't even install the second AC connector. Those AC grids feed these AC to DC power supplies. These are the power supplies that take care of the robots and also the drives. They're all redundant, hot replaceable. If one of them fails, we can take it out and replace it. The whole system will continue to run. How is that different? Well, in the past, we actually had the power supplies on the drive tray. What that meant is if a power supply died, that drive was down. Moreover, since the power supply was on the drive tray, you had an AC input on this drive. So you would take typically half of your drives and connect to one leg, half to the other. If you lost an AC leg, you'd lose half your drives. Now you can lose an AC leg or not even install it, everything will run normally. You could lose a power supply, again, everything will run normally. The last piece on high availability I wanted to cover in the back of the machine is cables and connectors. So we tried to greatly reduce the number of cables and connectors in the 8500 compared to previous libraries. So for example, the Powderhorn library that it replaces had 12 printed circuit cards just in the library control unit that attached to the side of the silo. There's additional electronics inside and additional electronics in the library management unit and then that was all connected by a series of cables. That was all shrunk down in the 8500 condensed to this one single card here. 
So all those cables and connectors that can fail are gone. This card offers single or dual TCP IP connections to the host to provide TCP IP failover. And then the other thing I should point out on cables and connectors is every library, including our Powderhorn, had a flex cable and a connector on it uh, so that we could control the robot. As you'll see on the front, the 8500 has no cables or connectors running to the robots. They're effectively untethered because we modulated the power rails that the handbots are running on. Also in the rear of the machine, you can get up to four 6U racks. These allow you to install hubs and switches so you can cable from your fiber drives before you run out of the library, saving you some floor space elsewhere. Lastly, I'd like to point out that the width of the SL8500 is only about half that of the powder horn. I'll show you how we were able to do that on the front of the machine. Let's take a few minutes now and look at the front of the SL8500. I'll go ahead and start the robots up and then I'll explain a little bit about our design. Just going to kick off an audit. One of the things you may notice looking in the front is that the shape is very different. Up until now there were two fundamental shapes for libraries. There were linear designs and then there were circular designs. In the past, we had chosen circular over linear for two reasons. One is floor space. So if you look at a circular design, if you stretch it out to make it linear, it just takes up a lot more of your data center floor space. We didn't want to do that. Second thing on linear is by definition of the word, there's one and only one way to grow. So as you add more drives, more capacity, and fundamentally more work to the system, that same robotics has to travel further and further to handle the work so in reality, your performance goes down when you need it to go up. Uh, that can work okay, linear can work okay for an archive, but not so good for everything else. So our objectives for our engineers were, number one, you have the best floor space, make that better. Number two, you have great performance, see if there's something you can do better on that. And then number three, do that one piece you can't do in a circle, and that's replace a robot while it runs. So if you recall, the last piece of high availability we spoke about on the back was replacing robotics. I'm going to show you how now that I'm in the front. So let's take these one at a time. In terms of shape, by taking that big motor out of the middle of the library and actually putting it on each robot, we freed up a lot of space. We then broke the circle open to a U and compressed it. So it is about 25 to 50 percent less floor space than our previous libraries, which were best in class. For performance, as you look behind me, you notice we have eight robots in here working in parallel. Why did we do that? Well, nobody buys a large library and connects it to one PC running one task. So what a library sees are a whole bunch of servers sharing it, and it sees asynchronous mount requests. So we're multi-threaded. We can do eight things at once instead of one thing at a time. That helps on system performance. For the last piece, replacing a robot while it runs, what I'm going to do now is take one, of the one, take one of the robots offline. So it'll be simulation of if it had an error. And what you'll see is this particular ro robot here, as soon as he's finished that task, will come to the front and park himself in the service bay area. The next thing you'll see is that his twin will actually come over and pick up his workload for him so that no jobs get missed. So you notice all the robots are still working in parallel, and his twin comes over and picks up his audit right where he left off. Okay? The next thing that would happen is our service tech would then come here and turn this key to activate the service bay door, and then this door will slide across as you see now, so we can replace that robot while the whole system continues to run. So our service technician would show up with a replacement robot, and notice we're not replacing just the gripper, but the entire robot. A couple of things about the robot. Number one, he actually has two motors and two-wheel drive. So even if a motor breaks, the other motor is good enough to power the robot into the service bay area. If something should happen and the robot is unable to move itself into the service bay area, his twin would actually have pushed him into the service bay. At this point, our service technician loosens two screws, removes the entire robot, 
and would hang a replacement robot. We would then turn the service safety door back to the center position and you'll see it slide across there. And at this point, I can bring the robot back online and he'll go back to work. The other thing that the U-shaped design gives us is two ways to grow. So if you go back to our story on linear, there's only one way to grow a line. Likewise, with circular design, there's only one way to grow, which is via pass-through to another circle. With the U-shaped design, we can do either or both. So we could take the U and grow it lengthwise to build, for example, an archive. And we can also attach them side by side via pass-through. So let's take a walk over to the side and I'll show you those two ways to grow. Let's take a look at how the SL8500 can scale. The base machine comes with a back piece that houses all the drives, the back of the U, and then the front of the machine. In this configuration, it houses 1,448 slots. To grow it, in between the U and the front, you can have 0 to 5 of the expansion units, each of which is 1,728 slots, so with five of them, that takes us to 10,000 slots total. To allow you to grow without an outage, you can purchase the expansion frames up front, we can install them, and you can license the slots later. That allows you to grow all the way up to 10,000 slots. Let's talk about the other way to scale the SL8500 by a pass-through. There are two key things that are new on the SL8500 pass-through. First, it's quad redundant, so that way should a mechanism fail, we can actually replace it from the rear while the whole machine and whole system continues to operate. Secondly, it can be attached hot while the first library continues to run. So let me walk through an example. So if you have a SL8500 of whatever particular size and it's time for you to grow and you want to add more drive bays, you want to add more slots, you, and you want to add more robots to service the additional workload, you can order a pass-through port and a second SL8500 and we can attach it while your first system continues to run. You don't have to schedule an outage. So while that first library is running, we would pop off the cosmetic skins that would be here and here, attach this pass-through frame with the four mechanisms. It'll continue to run. The actual slots where the pass-through goes through are always left vacant in every SL8500 we ship, so everyone is built to scale while it runs. After we attach the pass-through, we would attach the second library where I'm standing to the pass-through port. Meantime, the first library continues to run. The second library would go through its initialization and audit and then report into the first library, thereby the whole system growing without taking any scheduled outage. Let's go take another look at the front of the machine now. Let me show you just one more feature in the front before we conclude. If you're designing a library, this is actually a pretty nasty problem. And it's actually worse than I'm showing you because all three dimensions are different. And it's worse than I'm showing you that this is LTO. This is our fast access dual hub 9840. Uh, we also do the SDLT cartridge, which is a yet another set of three dimensions. So if you're designing a library and you have to accommodate that, it's pretty tricky. So what most, most vendors do is they, they come to you and say, well, how many slots of this do you want and how many of that do you want? They build that for you and that works for you on your first day, but then life changes and so do your needs. And that would require an outage as they reconstruct your library to your new requirements. What we ask our engineers to do is let's make this our problem. We would like any of these to go anywhere in any combination. So how did they do that? Well, you notice the notch in the larger car cartridge. Every slot in the library, not just the cap here in the front, but everything in the library, has fingers in it so that the larger cartridge slides deeper and the shorter one not as deep. As you slide into the slots, we don't care about the height difference at all. The robot always grabs from the side and grabs by a pressure. So even though the depth is different, the height is different, the length is different, the robot can always hit the same spot on any cartridge and put anything in any slot. As you can see, the SL8500 has many innovative features. Prime among them are its ability to make consolidation much easier, to provide the highest possible availability, 
and to help save on your environmental costs. Please feel free to contact Sun Microsystems and we'll show you even more of its features as well as our other enterprise solutions. Thank you.